So, uh, welcome. Today we have a guest lecturer, uh, Jonas Schubert Alansson from My Code Works, or My Code Works, My Code Works, I guess. Either or, way. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I hope he will confirm all the truths I've already conveyed to you. Uh, and he's very keen on taking questions. Uh, you're getting involved and active, so. Uh, we have activated Slack, so you have, if you have any questions, uh, uh, post them there. Or uh, if you're in the classroom here in Becker, well, uh, you're of course always welcome to interact. Yeah. So, please join us. Thanks. So uh, I'm also going to ask questions, <coughs> and I will wait until someone answers. So, if you feel like answering, don't wait too long. Um, I titled this talk "Tools and Tasks." for reasons that I hope will be obvious when we're done. We're going to talk about uh, software development processes and uh, project managing processes that I have encountered in various different companies where I've worked. And I know that you're a first year student and you have a kind of a crystallized image of what these processes are. And uh, that's generally not how they actually play out, as you will see. But um, <coughs> let's start with some audience participation. Would you say this is a great tool? First of all, do you know what it is? Yeah, it's a, it's a multi-tool. It's a Leatherman Wave. Uh, I own one of them. And I think it's a pretty awesome tool. So. The reason I ask is the question is something a good tool doesn't usually have uh, a single answer. So this is a good tool for many things. Since it's a multi-tool, it's a better tool for more things than most tools. It's a pretty crappy code editor. Uh, it can't do continuous integration, sadly. And um, if you're going to dig a hole, it won't help you much either. So. Depending on task, this is a rubbish tool or a great tool. So this all comes back to the NFL. Uh, any of you have heard of it? And it's not the National Football League. It's the no free lunch theorem, which two guys, <coughs> uh, Wolpert and McReady, postulated in 97 the uh, not so formal presentation of what it means is there basically they're saying that they're mathematicians they work in set theory and optimization algorithms so like optimized search and there they postulated a theorem that said that any algorithm that's optimized for one specific case is also by definition suboptimal for all other cases so if something is best at one task, it's also worse at some other task. Uh, in their field, it's kind of interesting because if you have a set of numbers that you want to sort and you have a sorting algorithm, you can always create an optimal sorting algorithm for any given set of numbers. Because if you, if you know the set of numbers, you can always get like the optimal number of mutations you have to do on the array of numbers to get it sorted but generally that algorithm will only work for arrays of that order so it's suboptimal for all other solutions and in some cases it will return the most unsorted array as a result instead so it's actually uh, the worst possible tool and if you like set theory that's the the formal definition I kind of enjoy pretending I like set theory because it gives you a lot of math cred if you do. And most people don't know set theory. So you can usually get away with throwing set theory around because they can't call you out. Just avoid like uh, hanging out with mathematicians at university and you'll be fine. Um, so the no free lunch theorem is generally used in computer science even outside of like mathematics and search optimization and it's it's a, the generalization is that <coughs> you can't pick one tool that's best for all jobs 
which is what we're gonna come to, I hope, at the end of this. So do any of you have a favorite like project management or development um, methodology yet? How many here are dreaming about working for a company that utilizes waterfall, for example? No, more, more the agile cried maybe? So agile development? Again, please. No, I just said extreme programming. Extreme programming, yeah. It's a good choice in my book. Anyone else? RUP, maybe. The Rational Unified Process. Great Swedish export from Ericsson. They're still selling it. I think it was like made in the mid 80s. So, <clears throat> do any of you do hobby programming? I hope so. If you don't, you should. Uh, which development methodology do you use when you are hobby programming? I think you all use the just get things done methodology, because that's what I generally use when I'm programming for myself. So the reason we all use the... I just realized the, the slides are slightly more broken. The, the reason we all utilize the just get things done or like just do it uh, when we're alone is that there isn't a need for a process. It's just you. You're holding all the information about the project. In some cases, for example, if you're doing a task for, for a course at school, you might have to, um, to create some documentation or like solve something that's not code, fill in a form or turn in uh, tests or some other related piece of information. And that would be some kind of process. But normally if you're just doing it to learn or just doing it for fun, you won't have a process. So it's just you, you don't have much information. And the no channels part is you have no one to share the information with. You have like no communication channels that you need to manage. The scope is usually small by necessity because none of us can like write windows at this point. Uh, so you have a very low need for any process at all. <coughs> so let's, um, oh yeah, and some notes might still be a good idea since you might put your project down for a month and then come back to it after a few months. And if you haven't made any notes of what you were doing, you will be, like most of us, very confused about who wrote this code and why it's so bad. So what if we step it up a bit, just include one more person. So it's you and a friend, you're working on a small project, either a school, school project or uh, maybe you have a, a startup dream, you're building your minimal viable product in your spare time. Now you have some information, right? You have to have to talk with the other person or other persons if you are more than one. So you, you still have to share. It's not a lot. <coughs> and you have few channels because usually it's just you and another person. So you have one communication channel. Um, the project scope is still pretty small normally. So you have a low need for process, probably no formal process at least. might be a good things to agree on stuff like where you're going to do source control. Uh, sending patches by email is not okay anymore. So, <coughs> uh, right now I'm doing an open source project. So I used to work at Fort Knox, which is like over there somewhere. It's pretty close. And uh, while I was there, they launched their version 3 public API. So do you know what Fort Knox does? Oh, okay, they do like bookkeeping and inventory management software and invoicing, stuff like that, like for small and medium businesses. So it's um, web-based and all of your data is in the cloud. It's uh, pretty nice. While I was there, I started working on, I'm a, a Ruby programmer or I, I prefer to program in Ruby if I have the choice. So we started, or I started building a gem to wrap the raw REST API 
So they have an almost restish uh, JSON API that you can use. So I started to wrap it in a gem to like create classes for all of the entities like customers and invoices and bookkeeping events uh, to make it easier for me to work with because I have this dream. Uh, I was going to build a small web shop uh, thing using Fort Knox as one part and a payment provider as the other and just sticking some HTML in the middle. I haven't gotten that far yet, but the, uh, the API gem is coming along. So I started it there and then I kind of got swamped at work and things happen, as you know. So I put it down for a while and uh, I picked it up about a month ago when I got a call from a guy called Hannes who works at a consultancy in Enshipping. So he, he is a consultant for a consultancy, so he's not actually employed by the consultancy. And the consultancy has a customer that wants a product that integrates with Fort Knox. So he pinged me on GitHub because he found my gem, which isn't done or wasn't done, but it was like started at least, and he found it. So he said like, what's your plans for this? Are you gonna, are you gonna do anything with it? now or is it dead and I was like yeah I'd like love to do it but I haven't had time so we talked a bit and he decided that even if he were to like literally write the rest of the gem himself if he didn't have the gem he would have to do that job anyway because he needed to integrate with Fort Knox and if if I helped him since I have some insider knowledge still on how like the API works and the backing models work he, he could probably save some time seemed reasonable to assume it, we would work faster at it together than apart. So if you have a friend, someone you know, like a childhood friend is best for this example, a, a programming childhood friend, um, then you have usually shared, like you have a lot of shared background and you usually share values because that's why you're still friends. So when you're communicating, you have a low overhead. You have no cultural barriers that you need to worry about. You speak kind of the same language. You have the same frame of reference. So it's rather easy. And I was lucky with Hannes because <coughs> Hannes and I were, we don't know each other. We have never met. Um, we've spoken a few times like on Hangouts. Uh, we use Slack, which I know you are familiar with as well, to communicate on a day-to-day -day basis. And we use like GitHub pull requests and issues to document what we do. It's, it works pretty well because we have, even though we haven't grown up together, we have it like a shared background or at least we are interested in the same kind of languages and approaches. So we're a few, right now we're two, but it's an open source project. So more could join or, and probably will, especially when we're finished with version one that actually works and is useful to people they might start using it and then they might start contributing back. So right now we're two, but we might become more stakeholders. Um, we have some information we need to share. We need like a readme to document how to actually use the gem and we need to document how people should contribute. We might need to document like our coding standard, which we have done formally by using a an automated tool. So the configuration file for that automated tool is essentially the documentation for how you should format the code. Uh, and it will tell you if you do not. It's, a, it's, it's not small, small scope, but it's still below medium, I'd say. I mean, it's a few weeks of work together to finish it. The only reason why it's taking so long is that he's doing other things and I'm doing other things. So we work at it maybe one day each a week. Um, so we have some need for process, but we're both kind of test-driven development people, and we're both kind of working in agile environments anyway. So all of these kind of fell into place without too much discussion. Um, and if we have something that we need to discuss, we just hash it out on Slack in like 15 minutes. Um, I, I used to live in Vecco, so that's why I've worked at many of the companies that we're going to go through are from Vecco, and that's because I used to live here. So I worked here for a few years. Anyone heard of Standout? Okay. It's, um, it's a local 
uh, Rails dev shop mainly. They do WordPress and stuff as well, but they are focusing on, on uh, Rails and they have a few products as well, at least one. And oh, two, because one is open source and one is a paid product. Um, so they're kind of, when I, so when I worked there, it's at least three years ago, maybe four years ago. So they take client projects, right? You get someone walking in the door, they want the homepage, or maybe they have this business idea they need some kind of app to support the business idea, which is not like a WordPress site, but something slightly more complicated. Usually it's small things. So a project is a few weeks to a month or two for a single developer. And some <coughs> things for like returning customers, some of the things are really small, like you just have to fix a typo on a WordPress site or you just have to update some new content. Um, but the development projects are usually small. So when I worked there, we were between three and five developers, I think, depending on exactly <laughs> when we're looking. But it's a small team, and there was a lead developer, the owner, uh, and a manager, which was, uh, he wasn't a developer, so he was just managing. <coughs> and since they have a company, they need to generate revenue and to generate revenue, you invoice customers. So there is a need for process here. <coughs> the, the end result of the process is that you should be able to like, get the money that you should from your customers. Uh, hopefully most of the employee's time will be accounted for, so you know which part of the employee's time should be invoiced to which customer. But we didn't have, I mean, since the projects are rather small, you don't really have a lot of documentation needs. Uh, you don't have a lot of channels. I mean, I have to communicate to my boss, like on technical questions, how should we solve this or which of these two technology choices do you prefer? Uh, and I have to talk to my manager about which customer I should be working on and how long I've been working on a certain problem and how long I think the rest of it will take. And those updates are pretty frequent, especially the ones where you update your manager on progress. Uh, because that's the the business side's main focus, right? They have sold something to someone for a certain price. And that price translates to a certain number of hours of your time, and you are supposed to solve the problem in that time or less, but hopefully not more, because the bottom line is they won't afford to keep paying your salary if you do that too much. So we didn't have a formal process. It was, uh, we had a weekly meeting, which is kind of a uh, general status update. It's like a daily stand-up, but we did it once a week instead. We had the, they had their own project management tool called Extra Brain, which I think is now a product, like a SaaS product that you could get an account and use. Um, where you, you create projects, you create tasks for the projects, and you log time on the tasks, and at the end of it, on the like management side of the application you can then do like time reporting per customer and per project uh, and you can also get lists of which tasks like user stories were done during a period of time so you can send your I both invoices and reporting material to your customers so while i was there i did a lot of small projects um, <coughs> and we did one larger one that went for I think we, in total, I mean, it was broken up in parts, but we didn't do it all as one project. So, but in total, I think we spent six months on it, or I spent my last six months on it. And already there, because it was for a company that we will get to in a bit. Um, even just for that project, you could notice the change in communication needs. So a normal like business owner um, that comes in and wants a homepage, they're not very interested in status updates, right? They have no one to report to. They're happy if they're happy, and if they're not, they will tell you. But if you send them weekly reports, that won't actually impact anything. They'll still be happy if they're happy, and if they're not, they let you know. So, and that's because they're not used to a process either, right? This is probably their first web development project so they trust you because they have no reason not to. 
uh, and hopefully it ends well and they'll come back. But for this larger project, for a, a larger company that has a lot of stakeholders internally, they needed a lot of reporting. So you basically sent detailed reports once a week on exactly which uh, sub projects which developers had worked on for how long, which tasks were done, which tasks were still in the backlog and which tasks were being worked on and the progress for each task that was started but not finished. So it was like pretty extensive reporting. And that's because they have someone in the other end that they need to report to as well. So they need all of this detailed information in their process to be able to generate some kind of reassurance up the chain. So right now, so all of these positions uh, except this one that we're going to talk about now uh, has been as a salaried employee. So I was actually like working there 40 hours a week <coughs> and getting a fixed salary. But since the middle of last year, I've, I've had my own company for a while, but I haven't done it full time. So since the middle of last year, I've been doing it full time. And the first major client I picked up and I'm still working with is replay gaming so replay gaming is about the same size in persons as standout but they're vastly different than standout so uh, we're four developers at replay now uh, at most we were six um, they have they're not I mean uh, Standout is basically a services company. They produce products, but they're actually selling the service to produce the products. They're not selling the finished product. Whilst Replay Gaming is also a service company of sorts because they're charging their end customers for a service, but that service is provided by an internal product. They have a poker platform. So Replay Gaming is a social gaming site. They have um, a for fun money poker site. So you can basically buy chips on the site and play for the chips on the poker tables, but you can't turn the chips back into money. It's a one-way street. You can only get chips for money. You can never get money for chips, which is a huge difference in the gaming space. So it's not, this is a gaming site, but it's not a gambling site. That's the major difference. So a, a gambling site is where you can actually make money. And a gaming site would be, I mean, even a, a Counter-Strike server is a gaming site of sorts. It's a service that affords you gaming, uh, but no one would consider it gambling. And this is the same thing then. So they are not regulated normally, like for money, gaming is pretty heavily regulated. Um, but they have a poker platform. So uh, in Replay, we have a single owner, which is kind of rare. I mean, usually you have uh, stock owners uh, and a board and someone who is the CEO. Uh, but here it's just one guy and his name is Paul. He lives in London. So it's a London based company. It's registered in, in London. But I'm, I work from Sweden. Um, the other devs are in Brazil, uh, India, where else? Oh, and so the support people are in, uh, in the US. So we're spread out over four continents, basically. <coughs> uh, but for stakeholders, we have end customers. They need to be happy. And we have Paul, the owner, and he needs to be happy. Uh, and I have colleagues, and they need to be at least informed, hopefully happy, um, about what I'm doing and what we're trying to achieve. But we still have a lot of information. And most of that information is um, in the form of legacy code. So it's a pretty large project. It's been alive for 10 years. It started its life as a PHP application. It's turned into a Rails application after a rewrite. And we are trying to basically split this monolithic Rails application into smaller parts uh, and create uh, a microservice ecosystem out of it. And it is a good fit for a microservices ecosystem. Not everything is. So we have some, some communication channels. We need to communicate information. So Paul is not the developer. He's a non-technical person, almost. Um, so I have three other developers that I need to communicate with. 
we have a weekly meeting on Mondays to like status update everyone on what we're all doing. Uh, and Paul also is also in the meeting. The support people are also in the meeting. So it's a general status update. The support people tell us which complaints they've had. If they've had spikes of complaints on the site, for example, might be good for us to know so we can find out what the issue is and fix it if we haven't gotten any automated alerts for it. Um, and we have to like communicate to the end customers. Normally that's just the good kind of communication, like they have forums, so someone has to answer questions in the forums. Uh, customers can open support tickets, someone has to answer the support tickets. Uh, we communicate with them also by like promotions, uh, having special tournaments for Valentine's, for example, things like that. And then we have the technical side of it where we need to update Paul on like how we are doing on the main goals. Uh, we need to keep each other updated so we are not running over each other or uh, putting double effort into solving some problem. And we also have to document everything for uh, the next developers, right? So right now we're four. We're expecting to grow by, like customer-wise, to grow by 30 to 35x in five to 10 years. So I doubt very much that we'll only be four developers by then. And all of the new people that we're gonna onboard for both support and for the technical side of things, <coughs> they're gonna need to have information on the current solution. So it's a very large scope where, I mean, we're planning five years ahead for everything we're doing now. It's basically do the solution that we have for this problem, support the growth we expect to have in five years. That's kind of the scale of the project. Uh, so there is a clear need for process here to manage all of this. Like all of the different stakeholders should get their information. We should also make sure that we improve the code because the current, current uh, code quality is uh, in some cases not great, as often is the case with the older code. Um, right now there is a process. It's not... <laughs> I know that Paul is going to watch this, so I have to be a bit careful about what I say. Um, it's not formalized. There isn't a process document where I can go in and read and say, yeah, we're following this and this. You should do this in this case, and in that case, you should do that. So we're trying to actually get there, because I think that we've had a lot of turbulence in the team in the last six <coughs> months. We had uh, two new people join, me and the Indian developer. And we've had a few people leave. So, uh, and if you, I mean, it's just two people in and two people out. So it doesn't sound like a lot, but that's basically replacing 50% of the development team. So it is a lot. Uh, you lose, if you don't have very rigid documentation procedures, you lose a lot of information when people leave. So in this case, for example, we have one guy that's responsible for the infrastructure. He's the ops guy. And, uh, <laughs> he has done a lot of work on documenting before he left, but there is still, I mean, he's been handling this platform for at least five years. Most of it he built and configured and like set up on bare metal servers. Uh, and it's not, I mean, it's difficult to document things after the fact, because if I sit down and try to document my workflow, I will only document the things about my workflow that I think is non-obvious. So the obvious things I won't even think about because they're obvious. But they might not be for you. So <coughs> it's difficult to do high quality documentation after the fact. So that's one part of it. We need to be better in our process to document code with tests, document behavior with specs, uh, or user stories <coughs> and uh, like creating overall documentation. I would like to be able to, now we have a bare metal server system, so we have physical servers that are connected in virtual, uh, virtual networks. So you, you should like to be able to pull up a page where you can see where all the servers are on like which networks and how they're connected together uh, and which services are running on which server. And 
I mean, there isn't such an overview. At least I haven't found it. Uh, so some kind of more overarching documentation on architecture and stuff. So we're in the in the process of creating a process, and we're it will probably be somewhere between Scrum and Kanban. The reason for Kanban is this is this is another thing. If you have a small team that decides on its own process, you tend to decide on a process that solves the problems you are having right now. And one of the problems we are having right now, or they have been having for a while and we are still having, is that we start large projects without finishing them. So it, there is poor follow through, uh, which is bad because you, you invest heavily in resources in doing things that aren't finished. And if they're not finished, they can't produce value. So I agree we should get better at it. But I think that's one of the reasons we're leaning towards Kanban, because Kanban is a process that tries to force you to actually close stories and finish and limit the amount of work you have running at once. <coughs> um, what's the time? 46. So, does anyone have any questions? Nothing on right, Slack either. Okay, Jesper, go for it. Uh, you say that the team, the teams define, but the team defines its own process. Yeah, in this it case. Tends to be Yes. More lightweight than, than it, but is, 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 is it a is it a is the process a a decision or is it something that emerges? So Jesper is asking several questions. <laughs> he points out that when a team decides its own process, it tends to be lightweight, and I think that's true, especially for smaller teams. Uh, and I think it depends on where the decision of the process is being made. At this, I mean, our process is being decided by the developers and no developer likes a lot of process. So yeah, it's gonna be lightweight. It's one of the goals. Uh, the other thing was, what was the second part of the question? I know the feeling. Yeah, if it was a, if it was a conscious, if, if it was a decision, ah, yeah. it was something that, it, that emerged. So if, if it's an actual decision or if it's something that emerges, the new process. So I think it could be either, like it depends on the situation. In some cases, like for the open source example with me and Hannes, we don't have a formal process, it just happened, but it works because we're kind of aligned already. So we don't have to have a formal decision. If we had another one, another person joining, we might need to have that discussion. But right now we haven't had uh, any need for the discussion itself. And in this case, we have, we have the cultural things, we have the seniority things. So in the replay team, I'm the most senior developer, but I'm not the most senior on the team. So uh, <laughs> I'm actually junior on the team. I got hired second to last. I think the uh, Pranav from India, he got hired like a week after me or something. So. He's actually the junior developer. And that's, that's always an issue because, of course, as a senior developer with experience, I have preferences and I have reasons for those preferences based on my experiences. And I would like to, uh, I mean, everyone would like to have it their way, I guess. But, you know, you, you have strong reasons that you would think that one solution is best for this particular problem. And at the same time, it's that cultural thing with who's been in the group the longest, which is kind of unwrittenly the person who has the most say, like seniority on the team. So <coughs> I, I don't in any way want to dictate how we all should do stuff, but you have these kind of carefuls, careful uh, decisions to make, right? So you want to preserve everyone's interests, I guess. Uh, and that would depend as well. If you're all very well aligned, you might not have a conflict and the decision might be very easy. In this case, I think the decision will be pretty easy. 
we're, we're well aligned, if not perfectly on all issues. But everyone wants a lightweight process. Everyone wants something like Scrum, Kanban, XP-ish, because we all like those kinds of things. I don't think anyone has a very strong opinion on exactly which we should choose. I think we're all agreed on that process has to change over time, which is one of the fundamental parts of Scrum, by the way, which makes it a good process. Because even if you adopt it, you don't actually adopt what's written in the books forever. You just adopt that as the platform to develop your own process. <coughs> but I think we differ somewhat on like which tools are the best to use for this actual like this particular process. Some of us, like me, I've had since I, which we're gonna get to in the second part. But I worked with larger companies that use like corporate style tools. Those are uncool, right? It's like Jira and Confluence. It's like big uh, <coughs> issue management systems and big documentation management systems. And they aren't cool, but they're good. They're very good. So I'd rather have a very good tool that I know can grow with the team's needs than a very hip tool that's like, it might fit our process now, but will it fit as well when we are 10 developers? Like in five years, will it still work? And I don't mind uh, evolving the process, but I would like to avoid migrating stuff from service to service to service, because it takes a lot of time. You always risk losing stuff because you forgot to copy some wiki page or whatever, and it's not producing any real value. The value is in the flexible tool that you can like co-evolve with your process. And for that, I think the corporate tools, like the enterprise tools, they're very good because they have to like, be that way. <laughs> Since not all corporations have one process, they all have different processes. Their different teams have different processes. So they need tools that they can adapt for their needs. So those tools are very good at adapting to different processes, which is nice. I actually had this discussion with Paul about Confluence yesterday. So <laughs> we are very much in the process of discussing and selecting tools and process going forward. And it won't be done for a few months at least, I would guess. So it, it's, it's, it has to be allowed to take time. It's more important to land on the right process than to land on it quickly. And since you are all going to get out into <coughs> like the, the real the real world in a few years and be working in companies um, I usually try to reinforce that you should always be looking for culture first so culture will lead process if you go to <coughs> Ericsson for example uh, Ericsson software it's a pretty large organization it's pretty old they do things a certain way and I well, I actually know that some parts of their organization have switched to Agile, but I also know it wasn't an easy fight. They really had to pull out the big guns to be allowed to try it and uh, persevere to be able to keep it. So if you end up in a company where the company culture matches how you like to work or with the, like, the people you like to work with, odds are you will end up with a process that either you like or that you all dislike and agree should change. So I know salary is important and I mean, everyone wants to do something either cool or worthwhile, preferably both. But there are many companies that you could work for. So I would say, I mean, even if you have to take a job because you have to have a job, don't stop looking then if that's not an ideal job for you. Keep looking until you find a good cultural fit. It will be more important than almost anything else in the long run. Good cultural fit, good boss. Uh, I would, this is a personal preference, but I like flexibility, like flex time, not necessarily eight to five all days a week. Uh, and then salary, so it's like fourth place, not first. I think we'll hold there for a while. So let's have uh, 15 minutes. 
and then we'll go on to talk about larger corporations. As I was saying, we're moving on up to larger and larger companies. And like the main thesis of all this is that depending on which problem you have, uh, the solution looks different. So now we're entering the realm of large to corporate size companies. And you've probably heard of a few of them, like the waterfall model. And I call it the dash model because after that they had the V model, which is basically going down and then up again. And after that they did the W model. So they're basically just cloning the model over and over to improve it. So <coughs> I don't know if you've seen like uh, the process schema for the W model, but it's pretty horrible. You should look at it as inspiration for what not to aspire to. Um, we have the spiral model. I don't actually know what that's called, if it has a formal name, but I know it's used by like the Department of Defense in the US because it's, uh, it's a model that kind of tries to start small and gradually increase in a spiral through a pie chart that describes different areas of the process. Uh, and the point of it is that you're trying to keep the risk constant while you're scaling the project. And uh, I think they've had good success with it in like their setting, which is very high demand military application style development uh, projects. So probably not a good idea for a startup. Uh, and then we have things like RAD, the rapidly Rap <laughs> rapid application development model, uh, Microsoft Solution Framework, which I actually honestly do not even want to know what it's all about. And then we have a RAP, which is uh, the Rational Unified Process that Ericsson did. That one is also known as the, um, like the Jelly Rat model, because what they did is they took waterfall and then they realized, okay, so it's not quite that simple that you can do like all of the specking in the beginning and then all of the implementation and then all of the testing and you have a perfect product. So they said, it's more like you do most of the specking in the beginning and then it kind of tapers out over time. And then you do most of the implementation and it tapers out over time. So it, there's the schema for the RAP model is different colors for different styles uh, like different tasks like planning and execution uh, and they are all like shaped curves filled curves and they all look a bit like jelly rats so it looks like several shelves with differently colored jelly rats on it. it's very pretty uh, probably works there I mean they've sold that process since the 80s and companies are still buying it so it must solve the problem for someone or they wouldn't buy it anymore. So I guess it's a good product <coughs> for large scale development. Um, so this is Fort Knox, which is right over here, like 200 meters from this lecture hall. It's not really large, large scale development, but it's, it's medium large scale. <laughs> so as I said before, they do like accounting software and stuff. So they have this suite of programs. They have like one module for accounting, one module for invoicing, one module for the invoices that you get from your suppliers, uh, logically called supplier invoices. And then they have some underlying models, like you have a customer register, you have your different, different accounts that you can uh, book stuff on, uh, yeah, and so on. So they have like modules, but they all work together in a suite. So you buy licenses for different modules uh, in this suite and you all you access them all through like the same web interface they basically become tabs in your web interface <coughs> so Fort Knox is a medium-sized company they have about a hundred employees or did when I left which is uh, well uh, seven eight months ago eight months ago uh, they were recruiting pretty heavily so they might be even larger now. They have a lot of developers, the development department in pure developers. They had like 25 developers. <coughs> and uh, 
they have more supporting staff around the, the development department like project management and quality assurance. So there's probably like 10 to 20 more people in the development department. So almost half of the company's employees are actually the development department, which is a lot. So not a huge company, but a very strong focus on its development department. The development department is actually what's building the company value, <coughs> which you can tell. So I think like um, org charts are always boring, but this one is pretty small and the next one is almost as small. So <laughs> unlike Replay, which has a single owner, Fortnox is like a normal publicly traded company. So they have a board, they have a CEO, and then they have like three major departments inside with company, which is sales support and that's end user support. So you can call in and ask them, how do I book this invoice that I got from Thailand? Um, and then you have the CTO, like the development department. So and the development department, and this is only the development department, looks like this. So you have the chief technical officer, you have a QA department with uh, about 10, 10 testers, like one test lead and nine testers, something like that. You have product owners. So each of these products like invoicing and so on and so on has an owner and that's e a non-technical person that works with like the specification for the product, requests for new features on the product, like the long-term uh, development and evolution of that product as part of the suite as a whole. And then you have the development department with like the <coughs> development chief, and his name is Jesper as well. Um, and then you have the actual teams, which is a, a project manager, uh, developers. One of those are the lead developer, like responsible for managing the actual technical work within the group and a QA resource. <coughs> So these project teams vary over time. So the way their process works or worked at least because it was kind of in flux when I left. <coughs> is that say you're going to add a new module. So you have to have a get a product owner for that module. The product owner then sits down with all of the relevant people uh, like customers, for example, uh, or people that know how competitors' products work, uh, generally just collecting all of the information about how the problem they need to solve looks, and then they formulate a solution, <coughs> and they spe specify the entire solution, uh, including like mocked screenshots of the different views. And when you're like at that level that the specification is done, uh, the QA department takes it and starts formulating test scenarios. They're not actually doing test cases yet, but they're, they're making a testing plan that says like, okay, so if the specification says that we must be able to handle like uh, this many things per time unit, we have to have a test for that specific case, right? So that's the test plan. You're not implementing the test, you're just making a note that we need such a test. And at the same time, it's turned over to one of these project groups. And the size of the project group depends on how large the project is. Like if, if it's a new critical module, that team will be large. If it's maintaining something that's working well, then it's probably small. It might not even have a project manager at that point. It might just be like a lead dev and two other developers maintaining one module with like QA and support, pinging them with new issues that come in using Jira, coincidentally. Um, so that's the, like the, the overarching structure, but you can already see here then that you have these, you have these three departments and they're not, they're not actually connected. I mean, they are in the business sense, of course, but the support, the support department doesn't care about the process inside of the development department. They only care about the, the products that come out, both the user facing actual like components and the 
the reports and documentation. So the support stuff, if you build a new feature, it's not done when you've built it and it's tested and, and approved. Then you'll have to document it. So there is user documentation for it so that your users can actually see how to use it. You have to train the support department to use it so they know how it's supposed to be used. And you have to, they then create other guides they do video guides for a lot of things so they like record instructional videos for how to do things so you have this chain of information that you need to maintain as well and the same with sales sales care about when will the next feature be done and which feature is in the pipeline now they they want as much material they can get to sell stuff so they want to sell features they want to sell new modules and sometimes they do even if they do not exist. So that's the problem. And that's, that's a failure of process, right? Your process should protect you from sales going to your customers and saying, yeah, yeah, no problem. We'll have it uh, by the end of this year. And you're like, the project plan says like the middle of next year. So you know you're gonna be delivering that feature six months late, or you'll have to like reshuffle the entire schedule just to meet expectations that sales set by mistake. Um, not so fun. But I mean, that's the perfect case where you need process. How do you keep that from happening? How do you keep sales updated with the actually relevant information? So, back to the bullet point. There are many stakeholders here. You have even more dimensions to the problem, right? Because you have you have the board and some people on the board. I'm not entirely sure if they had angel investors when they started. So Fort Knox was in the red for like seven years or something like that. It might even have been a few more, like somewhere between seven and nine years. They were in the red constantly. So you're running a company that's growing, um, <coughs> but you do not earn enough money to actually pay for your costs. You can't pay everyone's salaries. You can't pay for like, the building you're in. And then you need investors, right? So they had angel investors. I'm not entirely sure if all of the angel investors are on the board or if they are essentially like a separate group at the top. But they have a stake as well because they have, they have a part of the company. They expect returns on their investment. So, and they have been waiting a long time. I mean, Fort Knox is on what, the 12th year or something? And they haven't actually paid back their investors yet. So if you, <laughs> if you were one of the first ones to jump on, you've been waiting quite a while. So they're interested. The board, of course, is interested. And you have the CEO who is generally interested and should be about like all the departments. You have sales that are very interested in especially the project plan and how like progress is going on what you're working on and you have support and they're more of a user group for you because they use something that you produce and then you have the end users and they are i mean you have to keep them happy but at this point fort knox has something like a hundred thousand customers and a customer in this case is a company that has an account with them so each customer might be like a 20 person company so they count databases basically. So each database is a customer's, all the customer's information, like their invoices and bookkeeping and stuff. And they have about a hundred thousand of those. <coughs> so they have a lot of customers. And they also have another complicating factor is that they have two very distinct customer groups. They have the normal end users, such as me, cause I use Fort Knox. Uh, and they also have the large um, accounting firms, all of them are their customers and they're very important because if you have an accounting firm that's using a specific bookkeeping software internally and you get the new customer what are you going to tell that customer to use so it's it's almost like a referrer system where the accountant firms are referring all of their clients to Fort Knox so <coughs> you have a lot of information I've spoken about most of it but on the dev side you have tests in, in several different layers you have unit tests and integration tests at least and I hope they have API tests but I'm not sure um, 
So the integration tests are run. Are you any of you familiar with Selenium? No. Okay. So <coughs> you know, or you all know what unit tests are, right? Yes. Okay. So unit test is code testing code. Uh, integration tests can be written in code, but since this is a web page, it's kind of complicated. Because how do you how do you actually simulate all of it? Like you have to actually load the page in a browser and make sure that your stupid new image doesn't cover the button because in that case you can't click it. You can't really do that with code because in code you can tell it to click the button which means it's like you've used jQuery. Okay, some. Basically it allows you to select an element on the page and when you have it selected you can send method calls to it. So you can do select the button with the name blah 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 dot click that's how the computer would test it. The problem is if that button is under an image, you can still do that, but your customers can't. So to solve this problem, um, I think it was Mozilla that did Selenium. I'm not entirely sure, but it's basically a driver for browsers. So you get this programmatic API for an actual browser. So you will tell it to click a button, but instead of actually just selecting it using code and sending an event to it, it will try to position its virtual mouse cursor on top of it and issue a click event, like from the mouse, a real one. So if you have an image covering your button in this case, it won't work. Uh, so the Selenium tests are arduous to write. Takes a lot of time because you have to like actually map the user flow and Fort Knox has a lot of configurability. So it's not like you have the invoice module. It works this way. You have to test that you can do these 10 things and you're fine. It's like you have the invoice module and this module and these settings. So they can work in 50 different ways depending on how these settings and which modules are activated and what kind of data the user has in the database and blah, blah, blah. And writing test cases for all of that is virtually impossible but they have a growing suite of Selenium tests anyway, and those take a lot of time to run because to not get polluted test states, you know, you always delete all of your objects between test cases. And when you're doing unit tests, that's cheap. You just like zero out the pointer, create a new object and you're done. But in this case, you have to actually kill the browser instance and boot the new browser instance before you can run the next test. The next test might be something as simple as like the first click opens the dialog box the second click should like okay the dialog box that should be two tests so two browser sessions you have to tear down and build up so they're expensive they take hours to run and when they're done they'll probably take days if they ever get like a complete suite so that's that's part of the documentation and you can only guess how happy the Selenium test team is when the requirements change. <coughs> Can't we move this button to be on the other side instead? No. Uh, you have to like rewrite a hundred test cases. And you have <coughs> so you have these this uh, lots of information. And you also have we didn't talk about process documents, but when the product owner uh, when they start. Uh, planning for one of these larger projects. They have documents where you have to like fill in a lot of information about what kind of impact is this going to have on the database? Do we need any new like services running for ops? Uh, how many developers do you need? What kind of like specialities should they have? Like are they backend developers? Do you need many backend developers or do you need many frontend developers? They're not interchangeable. So so for resource allocation and to make sure that you have an okay on the technical solutions all the way before you start. So you don't start implementing something, go to ops and say, okay, now we need this service running. And they go, yeah, that's going to take several months because we have to rebuild how infrastructure works to support this service. So to avoid that kind of cost, you have this upfront cost instead of always running through the checklist and documenting all the answers you get from all the different technical stakeholders so that when someone <laughs> comes along three months later and questions why you did this stupid thing, 
you can actually look it up in the docs and say, oh, it was because we didn't know about factor X when we took this decision. We only discovered factor X two months later, so that's why it looks stupid now, but it actually wasn't before. And that happens a lot. And it, it almost always happens when you have large projects because um, the worst possible time to plan anything is now. You should always plan things as late as possible because you know the least about the problem you are trying to solve now, right? If you start working on the problem, tomorrow you'll know a little bit more and the next week you'll know even more. And the closer you get to the end, the more you know about how the solution looks. So trying to plan for anything up front is difficult and doing it perfectly is impossible. So you'll always have surprises. Hopefully you can gauge, I mean experience gives you the ability to gauge the kind of project you are in, what kind of risks there are and what the unknowns are. So you can at least say, okay, we need to do a spike to test this part because we have never done this. We have no idea how it works. It looks good on paper, but will it actually support our use case? Uh, so you, you have, we actually did a lot of discovery spikes on Fort, in Fort Knox, which is good, I think. So you, you can drive a short spike for a few days or a week with a very small team just to see, we want to use this queuing solution for a pub sub in the application. You test it and you load test it to see, okay, it, it looks good. It worked in our initial test on my machine, but how does it handle like 200 transactions a second? Does it hold up? Can it process? What kind of service do you need on the other end? I mean, who's gonna consume all of those messages? Uh, and those things, spikes are great for. So in this case, you have many stakeholders, a lot of information, many channels, a large scope, and therefore a great need for process. And exactly which process? Uh, that depends. <coughs> so uh, they were in the, it's, uh, the word process is very stupid because it comes up a lot. They were in the process of changing their process uh, when I left. So these are the complicating factors for Fort Knox when it comes to managing uh, the projects they have. Like this is just the dev part. No, it's not. This is all of it. Uh, yeah, and that's the documentation. We already covered this. I forgot I had slides. <coughs> Anyways, so they were, they were transitioning from a, a somewhat lighter weight actually. The, the PO organization like product owners, it wasn't this formal when I started. They had product owners, but it was, it was not a full-time job for most of them. They were like the single decision source for some things. Like if I need someone, to, and usually they were product owners because they knew that domain very well. I mean. The product owner for invoicing, for example, might have been someone who worked with invoicing for 20 years, and now she works in like the administration part of Fort Knox, but she's still the product owner for the invoicing part because she knows intimately how people who work a lot with invoices work, and they do not work the same as we. So <laughs> we had, like, when you enter the <coughs> the account numbers, for example, for like where you are going to book costs and revenues. There are like 10,000, uh, literally 10,000 different accounts things could be booked at. They go from zero to 9,999. And most of them are like have a speci specific designation. So your tax account has a specific account number in bookkeeping. So if you're paying taxes, <coughs> you're putting money into that account in bookkeeping. And if you get something back, like a tax return, you're pulling money from that account. But when we do this, you kind of type in one, two, get the drop down, and then you choose 1260 or whatever the account number is. <coughs> when they do it, they don't even look at the screen. They're just on the numeric part of the keyboard. And they are they're going so quickly that we had instances where the browser didn't catch all of the key events. That's how fast they're typing. You literally, we had a bug where they said, the new autocomplete isn't working. It's interfering when, when you're trying to type your numbers into like the account box. We're like, okay. So we profiled and looked for bugs and whatever for weeks 
until I realized that it was the same on the old system and the problem isn't that we're not handling it properly, we're not even getting the events because they're typing so fast that the browser drops events. So it's like, you need a better laptop. <laughs> That's the only way you can solve this bug. And that's something that like the invoice PO would know because they've done it. Um, <clears throat> but it wasn't this, when you started a new project or you wanted a change, you could ask the PO like, does this sound reasonable? Does it like mesh with how this should work? How is this intended to work? Things like that you could ask the PO. And it was a normal conversation. It wasn't actually documented anywhere. You might document it after the talk if you if you did a good job but uh, there it wasn't formally a requirement to document every change you made based on uh, <coughs> an informal talk with the PO so they they um, made that part more strict and at the same time they tried to I mean the developers always want agile right um, so did we at Fort Knox so we, <laughs> we transitioned to Agile-ish, Scrum-ish. So they had, they had Scrum, but they, <coughs> they estimated in time and they still specified everything up front, which in my book kind of takes away a few of the major goals of Scrum. So the, the whole thing where you can look at the stories in the backlog and prioritize and change them over time depending on how your evolving prototype looks and how testing goes that's out of the window because you already have the spec including how things should look on the screen when you're done uh, and the the other point with the time versus uh, i don't know have you talked anything about scrum estimations time points a bit so <coughs> when you start Scrum, so say you're my new Scrum team, it would probably split you into three teams. So you're my new three Scrum teams. <coughs> and when you start working, I ask you like, how long will this user story take? And how many, so how many points will this story take? And how many points do you think you can finish in a sprint? And our sprints are two weeks because I like two week sprints. So <coughs> you have no frame of reference, right? So you ha you'll just have to look at the story and say, yeah, it feels like four <laughs> or two or whatever. But it's pretty easy to, to, to take two stories and compare them and say, yeah, if this is a four, then this is definitely an eight because the relative size between stories is a lot easier to estimate than like actual size. So if this is four, then this must be eight and that one is six. And I think I can do all of them in, in two weeks. So I can do whatever that comes out to, 16? I can do 16 points in a sprint. So that's what you say, right? Four, eight, six, 16 in a sprint, and then you go and you finish them in one week. So your actual velocity might be 32 instead of 16, that's sprint. But now you have you have like created an estimate of how much work a point is and how many points you can can do so next time you'll say we did 32 last sprint so we'll probably do 32 this time as well and then you keep estimating your stories in like your unit whatever it is so this sprint team or this scrum team might have a different definition of what a story point is than this and than this so a point isn't a fixed thing it varies it varies with the developers and if you have if you do scrum over time in an organization you can actually track like story estimations and <coughs> burn down rates like how fast people work and if you move your developers around you can get very good estimates on individual developers because you'll get like if <coughs> the dude with a cap is in team one first, and then I move him to team two and then to team three, I'll, I'll get like a conglomerate of what the team's effort is, but you can still, if you move them around, you can split them out and get like each individual developer's individual sprint uh, points and 
and uh, burn down rates. <coughs> so it's a, it's a good system for, for getting numbers for something that's very hard to, to get numbers on. But you do not get the numbers up front. I can't say a story point is half a day. Sorry, Paul. Because um, then it's not a point. It's, it's half a day. It's four hours of work. You just tied it to a specific fixed unit that will never change. So now the points value can change. So all of your points are worth the same. And <laughs> when you do it, and team one has like does 20 points in a sprint, and team two does 30, then team two is better, right? They did more work. They, they worked at like 150% efficiency compared to team one. So we should fire team one, right? If I need to fire someone, I should fire someone from team one because they're worse. So you get into all of these weird things when you do agile estimation in time instead of points and you, you kind of break the model. So <coughs> question on the chat is, does the total amount of scrum points change over time for a team? Do you mean per sprint, like their estimate per sprint? Do, 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 do. If that's what you mean, then yes, it will always trend over time. It will stabilize in a range normally, but it'll never be like one fixed specific thing because everyone has like good days and bad days and that affects the sprint total. But you'll, you'll reasonably quickly, like within four or five sprints. Ah. So it says like they start taking 20 points for a two week sprint and then they feel more comfortable and can get more points. Yeah, so in my example, they guessed they would do 16 and in reality they did 32. And normally what you do is then you estimate 32 points for the next sprint as well. You basically base it on the average you have accumulated so far. So if they did 32 the first time, they estimate 32 the next time and they only do 28. For sprint number three, they'll estimate 30, because that's the average. And <coughs> you will get these variations, like by, it could be pretty severe. I mean, you can have variations of 25, 50%, maybe, on like the expected uh, number of story points for a sprint versus the actual for that particular sprint. But the average will be very stable over time. And that's what so, so that's the point of the point system <coughs> for the managers is that after like five or six sprints, you have a very stable average sprint point estimate. And you can look at which kind of stories have you done so far and what they were estimated at. And then you can use them as template for all of the rest of the stories you have. So you can get a rough estimate based on actual work done that says, okay, we have about 5,000 points left. We have three teams, their velocities are X, Y, and C. So 5,000 divided by X plus Y plus C equals that many sprints. Each sprint is two weeks. We'll deliver May 30th. And you know it. And the closer you get, the more exact this, you have like this burn down line hitting an exact date on the bottom graph. So it will wander a bit, but you'll like the further along you get, the more exact it will be. And you can also estimate based on the peaks in your point estimates and the valleys. So you have like a best case and a worst case. So you can project after six sprints <coughs> with a very good confidence an interval of when you can release your product. It's like between <coughs> January 5th and June 19th. And you know, like the gap will shrink over time because you like get more and more data and you'll hit a specific date unless like catastrophe strikes, of course. But generally it's very good for this. So <coughs> what you get is, and, and you, this uh, like projection of where you're gonna hit your date line, that's based on all the stuff that's left in your backlog. So if you, if you do your six first sprints, you do the projection and you see like, oh shit, 
that's like six months later than we need to be at market to, to be like first to market with this product. The only way you can solve it, or you can solve it two ways if you, if it's a very long project, you can solve it two ways. Normally you can only solve it one way. If it's a very long project, you can hire more developers. It will, like, it, you'll take a hit initially to get them all up to speed, but they will increase your, like, production speed over time, uh, but it'll take a while. And the other way is you have to cut stuff from the backlog. So either you keep everything in the backlog and you get this guarantee that we're going to hit somewhere here, and if you're aiming for a specific latest date, you have to move your projection so that your projection's latest date is that date. And the only way of doing that is cutting stuff in the backlog. And you can calculate, I mean, how much do we have to cut? How many story points do I have to cut to hit that date in the worst case? Well, I have to cut a thousand of the 5,000 points. Okay, which feature can we live without in the initial release to get there? So that's the whole point of, of the Scrum model and estimating in points. And if you do it in time, you get none of it. None. You can't do any of it. You're back with guessing at the beginning of the project how large you can make it and still hit the date. And, and no one will want to budge because you don't have this visibility into what the trade-offs are. In the Scrum system, you can very clearly see on the burndown chart and the backlog size what you're trading. Like, if I reduce stuff here, I get an earlier date here. If I put more stuff in here, I'll get a later date. But when you have one spec that someone did an estimate on, said like, yeah, that's a six month project with four developers. Okay, fine. So we'll be shipping in June. And then time goes on and you come up with this great new feature that would be really nice to have and you put it in the spec. Do you think they usually go around asking how much longer it will take? Do you think sales are gonna be upset when they've already like marketed when you're gonna come out with your new feature? That's the, the main point of the agile processes. They kind of give you a very clear and clean trade-off between the work, the workers, and the shipping date. It's the three things you have. Normally you don't want to change the workers because that has some unforeseen side effects most of the time. So you'll either want to change the work or the shipping date. Really easy. Um, <coughs> long rant, but hopefully useful because most people do not understand why you want a point system. And I'm quoting, I won't say who I'm quoting, but I'm quoting because I brought this up at Fort Knox and said that it's kind of pointless to do an agile process unless you have points. If you're estimating in time, you're like sawing off the foot you're standing on. Uh, <coughs> and they said, well, the board doesn't understand points. And I'm like, hey, how long did it take me to explain it? It must, might not have been the best explanation. I could have had graphics, but I mean, give me half an hour with the board and I'll explain points and they'll see the value. And after that, it's a very easy sell. So I don't know. I don't know if they've changed it. I really hope they have, but if they haven't. So this is what they did was they, they what they did were they had a process. It wasn't really working, so they needed to change it. And they said, Agile, that's like, our developers want Agile, it sounds good, it has all of the right value words, and we'll get guaranteed ship dates, because that's what you get with Agile, awesome. And then they took parts of Agile, and they are not getting guaranteed ship dates, so they're like, ah, crap, Agile doesn't work. Agile is crap, obviously, since we tried it and it didn't work. And that's, that's usually why Agile get a bad rap in larger corporations, because they do it wrong, and a good rap in small organizations because they do it right. So Agile does work, but I'd say if you have a, a I did say actually, if you have a company of Fort Knox's size and you want to do Agile, you should pick a methodology like Scrum or XP or uh, Kanban, whichever you prefer, and then you should like literally follow the book for six months. Just do exactly everything it says do not deviate and after six months if you feel it's a bad process don't use it 
if you feel it's a good process, but then change it. I mean, you've done it for six months, you should know. But if you've done it for a week, two weeks, a month, you don't know. I mean, you, you haven't even gotten into the groove yet. And you're still trying to change the process established by people who worked in the business for like 40 years, 60 years before they established the Scrum process. There's a very good reason the specific things that are in the Agile Manifesto is in the Agile Manifesto. It was put there by people with a lot of experience. Don't mess with it. <coughs> Sorry. I'm passionate about Agile development technologies. So if Fort Knox is a like, reasonably large company or medium-sized company, GTEC G2 is a huge, colossal company. Uh, anyone know about GTEC G2? Anyone heard of Boss Media? Yeah, a few. Okay, so Boss Media was, unfortunately, uh, a company started here in Vecchio by two people that I do not remember the names of. And they timed it perfectly. They basically did a, an online gaming company when the online gaming boom started, and it went very well. <coughs> they, uh, like after seven years or so, I think, they lasted, I don't know if they lasted 10, 12 years. Do you know, Jesper? No. Yeah, somewhere around there. So like about two or three years before the end, they were bought by G-Tech. I think it was only G-Tech by then which is, <laughs> is a part of the Lottomatica group. And Lottomatica is actually like the Italian state lottery got privatized and that's Lottomatica. <coughs> and they made a lot of money because that's what you do when you're in the lottery business and that's why you generally do not privatize state lotteries because um, it's like printing money. So they like started thinking, what should we do with all of this money? And they said, scratch tickets are pretty cool. So they like bought up the entire scratch ticket industry in Italy. So they own that. And then they bought like a few other state lotteries uh, or privatized state lotteries and a few other scratch card like dealies. And then they bought, I don't remember what they're called, but they're basically, they make the Jack Vegas machines, like these uh, digital slot machines. They bought them. <coughs> And they make money, uh, strangely, and they bought like online casinos and uh, they, they're a huge con con conglomerate when it comes to gaming, both like physical real world gaming and online virtual gaming. And they bought uh, Boss Media and Boss Media was basically one of the world leaders when it comes to uh, providing backend systems for online casinos. So they make the, the GMS, which is the gamer management system, is the, like the, the user back office where you can manage your players and uh, <coughs> see like statistics on exactly what they play and how much they play and how much they earn or lose you. Or like you can put them in specific groups and target ads at them, stuff like that. So it's a, a pretty advanced system when it was written, which is uh, quite a while ago. And then they have like a po they did have a poker network which they sold off to 888 I think, so uh, they still have a poker platform like the the software to run poker servers and clients to play real money poker. So that part is basically what Replay has, but they do it with play money instead of real money. Uh, so that's one part of what Boss Media did, and they also had online casinos and bingo trying to think like roulette and blackjack casino games online slot machines a lot of online slot machines not only their own they had like so there are companies that only make virtual slot machines and you can buy their games to put in your casino so what boss media wa did was they kind of bought games from many different suppliers and they packaged them up as their games so they fixed all the integrations and stuff and then they sold this huge package with like Casino and slots and poker and everything to casinos, online casinos. So they, I think they do uh, Svenska Spel actually, like the Swedish uh, national uh, gambling, state gambling organization. I think they run on, uh, on this platform still. And this is kind of a crazy industry. So, <coughs> 
if Fort Knox is down for a day, they'll get angry phone calls. They'll have to reassure people that they took steps that it won't happen again. They'll have to prove that all the data is still there, but it probably won't cost them anything. I mean, it will cost them in prestige, but they won't have to pay any fines or anything. If, <laughs> if one customer of bosses were offline for like a day, that would cost them somewhere in the range of like 5 million euros just in lost revenue for the casino that was offline. That's kind of the scale you're at. So if you have a server crash at that scale, you're prepared to pay a lot to get that server back up again quickly. So a uh, high stress environment, especially if you're working in ops, I would not like to work ops uh, for, for boss media. Uh, and they, they got bought by GTEC. GTEC bought some other companies and renamed itself GTEC G2. Uh, I have no idea what the G2 stands for, and GTEC is kind of a weird name as well. So, anyway, <coughs> so <laughs> officially, Boss wasn't Boss anymore. It was GTEC G2, which it said on the side of the house, but all around the, the inside of the house, it still said Boss Media everywhere. So, uh, technically, I didn't work for Boss, I worked for GTEC G2. So, I got there from Standout, where I worked before. Like the long project that we had at Standout, that was for GTEC G2. They had so uh, most of the money gambling markets in the world oh am i going over oh i'm going over anyways <coughs> so i got there from the project at standout uh so i had a very small project in one corner of gtech and gtech looks like this i think i don't know it's huge i mean they span many different countries they have bought a lot of different companies. So the org chart for GTEC is, I have no idea. I could possibly give you one pretty accurate for Boss Media, but I didn't. <coughs> so they have a huge amount of stakeholders. They have a massive amount of information. They have too many channels, to be honest, because I, I was on this like small corner project and I could still spend half of my working week in meetings. The scopes are huge. The projects run for like three to five years from that they sign a contract until they actually deliver the running platform. Uh, I'm gonna skip channels because I'm out of time. So <coughs> we started with this and I asked you if it's a good tool and I think we're going to end with this. It depends on what task you're trying to solve. So all of these weird large scale super processes that we hear a lot about like RUP and even waterfall are still used. In some cases they're even used for good reason. And I would guess that the reason that most of us like Agile is because we like working in like small tight projects and we like that kind of culture, which I think is a good thing. So if you like Agile, keep the fight going. And I hope you end up in a company where the culture fits the way you like to work. And if you end up in a company where the culture doesn't fit, move. There are many companies out there. So I hope you get some use out of my experiences. And thank you for listening. <laughs>